Welcome to the Tales of a Red Clay Rambler podcast, featuring interviews with culture makers from around the world. This is Ben Carter. I'm going to be your host. If you'd like more information on the show, please visit our website, talesofaredclayrambler.com. Welcome back to episode 361 of the podcast. Thank you guys for tuning in. Today on the show, I have a memorial episode for Christine McHorse. She passed away earlier this week, and I wanted to send my condolences out to the family as well as the folks that knew her and were influenced by her work in ceramics. She was born in 1948 in Morency, Arizona. In the 1960s, she went to the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe. There she met her husband, Joel, and later learned to make ceramics from his mother, Lena Archuleta, in a Pueblo style. In this interview, we talk about transitioning from the traditional Pueblo forms into the contemporary sculptural vessels that she was the most well-known for. I want to thank her for her influence and work in the ceramic community. It was a pleasure to get to sit down and talk with her. This interview is from 2016, but I wanted to put it back into the feed to pay homage to her legacy. So let's start by talking about how you got into clay. Um, well, I remember as a young child playing um, outdoors. Um, we'd go visit my um, grandmother who lives on the Navajo Reservation because I'm Navajo. And um, I, there would be clay around. And we, would, we didn't know it as clay. It was just mud that could be formed. And, and a lot of times... Uh, you know, I as a kid, I would see the the rain drops hit the uh, the dirt and form these little cups or little plates, and uh, I thought that was really cool. And I think from that point on, I was um, I love the smell of wet, damp earth, you know, and uh, and so I love working with my material. And so, did you grow up in Arizona, or did you where did you grow up? I I. Oops. I was born in Marinci, Arizona, which is a copper mining town. And um, my dad worked uh, as a bulldozer operator operator there, and he would um, unearth turquoise. And so turquoise is a, Marinci turquoise is a big deal up there around uh, the mine. And um, what I was, I'm starting to ramble again. <laughs> no, no, feel free. It's a casual conversation, but uh, you know he would he he had the same um, um, experiences I guess unearthing the the turquoise when the rain would hit it it would be just a beautiful blue and against the dark earth and um, so I have a real appreciation for the for mined <laughs> clays or stones and stuff like that um, but um, yes we we'd go back to the the Navajo reservations during the summers uh, between our, you know, school sessions. Turquoise and copper always go together, right? Like that, that mining area is yes. similar. But so is the clay, was there clay around those turquoise mine or the copper mines also? The, the clay, um, I, I, I'm not too sure about the, cl- I know there are clays up there, but I don't know what kind. That is a copper mine and it was an open pit mine. Nobody would go in there and to dig clay or anything like that, and so. But I don't. So I don't know. I, but I, you know, there are clays in those mountains. Yeah, because it's interesting when we are looking at your work. One of the unique parts of this region is the mica clay. Can you talk about how you get the clay that you use here? Uh, I get my clay yeah, around in New Mexico. Yeah, mm-hmm. here in New Mexico, uh, I get my clay up near between Taos and Picaris Pueblo, which is um, about seventy miles north of. Uh, uh, Santa Fe, and uh, we once every 
four years or so. We just uh, get get our pickup truck and and a bunch of barrels and and uh, head for the mountains because our clay, the mica clay, is is uh, we dig we dig it up out up in the mountains. It's above the the timber line. You know, it's just way up there, and um, it's not clay that. Um, runs down the mountain, you know, through the gullies and settles um, um, in veins down around the arroyos and stuff. This is, this, this is, got, uh, we get from up in the mountains, so. So it's almost a primary clay, like it decomposes and you guys get it from the source. Exactly. And we found, I, I when I married my husband, um, I was about 19, um, that is when I was introduced to to this clay, and uh, and before that, I had a little experience with with clay in high school. Um, I came here to Santa Fe when I was in going into the tenth um, grade in nineteen sixty three, and I stayed five and a half years. I I went a year and a half uh, postgraduate work, but. Um, had a lot of experience uh, with other classes besides clay. In fact, I came to Santa Fe to, I, I, I liked, I wanted to work with glass. Um, and um, I'm kind of glad that it, it went by the wayside when I came. You know, they, they, they dropped that class. And so I was, um, I took other classes uh, like jewelry um, classes. Uh, we were casting silver we were i took a, a a foundry class and we cast bronzes and and um and so i i guess what happened was i just just decided that the plastic arts were going to be my area i tried some painting and i didn't care for that i think it had a lot to do with the the makeup of the paint and the having to be around turpentine and yeah. stuff like that it just uh there are some things that my body just recoils from like like plasticine i can't work with plasticine <laughs> clay um so the so i guess the clay that i use it's just very pleasant uh, there's no nothing toxic in it you know and it's very practical and uh easy I shouldn't say easy, but um, once you learn how to process it and everything, it can be labor, you know, uh, extensive labor to fix it and everything. But it's still you. It's a, it's your product, you know, and it's. Um, uh, I've worked with with it for so long now. Like I said, since I married my husband, because it was his grandmother who introduced me to this clay. And his grandmother actually raised him, and uh, he. Um, so um, it's been, I would say, I think we're going on our forty seventh year this fall of uh, marriage, and and. Um, Congratulations! That's a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, uh, and um, I've worked with with it so long, and like. Day by day, you work with something so long, you, you tend to get better and better and better at it. So I've I've learned a lot of a lot about the clay. I think I have a kind of a head start on most people because before before I got into it and you and started using it, there was no real um, market for it because it was considered a very um, the actual uh, clay where was there was no appreciation for it. It was like a, a bakeware, uh, not a bakeware, but a cookware. And uh, that's what what's special about this clay is uh, the mica gives it a uh, high uh, thermal shock value and uh, you can place it on the flames. That's amazing. And you were saying that it was used to make bean pots for a long time. Yes, bean pots, any, a cooking pot. And, you know, beans being one, one thing you can cook, but also anything else. Um, it's, <laughs> it's even uh, safe in the microwave. It's, you know, it's, uh, it's, you can put it in a regular oven. You can, you can put it on a, on, in the coals in the campfire and stuff. And, and the um, 
clay will expand and contract without cracking. And beautiful clay. I mean, I feel like so much of your work is that rich black color, which we were talking earlier about your firing process, um, and that you use this high, high micaceous clay and then, I guess, reduce it in, in a smaller environment after it's been bisked or after it comes out of a hot kiln. So how did you think of that idea of, it's it's almost like a raku smoke firing, but not exactly the raku process. So how did you figure that out or, or come to that idea? Coming through, uh, I, I spent 23 years um, selling down on the plaza at the um, annual Santa Fe Indian Market. And this happens every, like this month, uh, August, the uh, third weekend of uh, every August, and then I think they're having like, I don't know, it's come going in the late 80s or something, uh, uh, the, the the year, years that they've had it now. But, um, I, you know, after a while, when you see that one market for one type of pottery has become um, either, how, why would I say this, uh, you need to move on to another market, in fact, I should say, because it's, it's just time to move on. I mean, I, I, I tend to get bored staying in one, one, doing one type of thing for a while. And so what I did was um, when I started out, first started out making pottery, I was doing small curio, um, curio wear, where like little turtles and little owls, because I wasn't very good at making pottery, but I could do these little animals. And uh, from that point on, I moved to larger pieces, bowls maybe, because they're pretty simple, and then pots. And, and, um, and when I first started, I started in the, uh, what they call the Taos, um, Taos wear, Taos type of pottery. And then after a while, I decided, well, I'm no longer, you know, want to do this and I wanted to do something different and if you live in this area within all the pueblos there's such a difference from one pueblo to the other of uh, the type of pottery that they do and the types of clays that they do and um, not only that uh, I decided well I'm I'm Navajo I'm not Pueblo and I should uh, maybe learn how to do a, a Navajo style pottery so I went and I uh, researched at downtown at a lot of the uh, the libraries and stuff and and uh, even at the museums and and I whatever I did whenever I found something on Navajo pottery it was always um, it didn't impress um, they they call they wrote it up as uh, mud mud pottery or mud pots. And probably because they weren't as refined as the Pueblo pottery. And I decided it was uh, time for me to change that. And I, I just made it a point to, to, to make better pottery and try the Navajo style. And the Navajo style, style pottery actually has a... Um, it's like a natural lacquer that is made from the pinyon pitch, the pitch from the pinyon trees or pine trees, and it's melted onto the pot, and that waterproofs it because um, the earthenware is not glazed and, it, and the water can seep through. Um, and so I, I, I watched I watched my grandmother um, after the pitch had worn off of one pot she would she would uh, melt some more and, and recoat it again before she used it and um, so I did that for a while and uh, then started doing some scraffito which means etching sort of onto the, into the pot and I I put a little bit of um, a sap or a pinyon pitch on that on my signature actually I started to sign my pottery on the bottom and uh, I found that the pitch was seeping into the uh, the uh, incised um, signature, and it was turning black, like real black. 
And that gave me uh, another color to work with. And it also gave me, uh, made me realize that I could do really fine hairline design and stuff like that. So I, so I started um, doing basket designs on little bowls and stuff. And, and uh, you know, it was just a, it's a natural type of progression where, where um, I was using natural materials and, and um, creating different design elements to, to, to make my pottery a little different, but cool. <laughs> <laughs> so did you feel like you, you were artistically going in that direction or you, the, the market in terms of that you wanted to reach a different market. So you needed a different style as you it went. It was both. It both. Yeah, it, it was both. I mean, I, you know, you, you, you hear, I mean, I mean, you're a craftsperson and, you know, I'm sitting out there trying to sell my stuff and, uh, you know, you're trying, and if you come through the Santa Fe Indian market, you're usually, um, putting forth your best work and, and trying to, um, take a, a blue ribbon or something because these help your pieces sell. And, uh, but I spent 23 years, uh, selling my work out there and I met so many people and, um, and I met so many artists and I had so much competition and I had, um, uh, just a lot of exposure to, to other types of uh, art and, and arts and crafts. And, and, uh, so somewhere, I guess when I got very confident in my craftsmanship, I was able to, to experiment and move into the, uh, you know, greater art. I figured, uh, arena or area. Did you definitively stop doing the market? Like say 23 years in, did you make a decision like, okay, this is it. I'm never going to do the market again. Um, I made the decision based on the fact that I had been there long enough, 23 years of sitting out there and, and, and it, it's very interesting to be sitting next to someone who, who has been there as long as you have, or on one side and another person on this side, and then people start to disappear. <laughs> they drop out or they, they pass away or, you know, you see the new up and coming younger uh, people. And I decided, you know, it's time for me to leave a space for somebody to come up through the ranks. And I felt like, again, like I said, I felt very fortunate and, uh, that I was at the level that I was where I saw myself and was getting more and more recognition. And I thought, you know, it's time for me to let go. And, um, again, um, they have their, um, standards and they have their little, um, um, categories and stuff like that. And I didn't want that anymore. That kind of a, can you explain that a little bit? The break between traditional uh, craft made in in specific categorical ways, and then what you do now. What I do now is 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 what I want to do. I'm not. I'm you know. I'm not trying to make a sale. You know. It, uh, I'm in a. I'm in a totally different place at this age. You know, at this time in my life, where where when we first began, my kids were little. We were there the day selling the weekend before st the school, you know, started and we were trying to make enough money to get by their school clothes. And we were renting a house in town. We were uh, moving, you know, around and trying to take care of my two uh, parents who were, who were age, aging, you know, and uh, uh, we were able to together, my husband and I, uh, come as far as we did as we, you know, we're, 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 we have this beautiful home that they built. And my two sons also, uh, had a hand in building this and it's grown so big that we're, it's, it's already becoming too big for us. So we're moving on to another, um, 16 acres of building a home there. And I mean, we've come a heck of a long ways. And so, I couldn't have done it without um, that kind of a market, being fortunate enough that I'm Indian, 
you know, selling Indian pottery, and you know, and I can, I could, uh, I could fill somebody's collection by say, okay, you don't really have something like this, so you know, you need this in your collection, and and and, and push it in that way, and uh, they would see that as well, you know, and and it's very, it was made a lot of friends through the years because they would come back year after year after year. And um, so. And, and I think for the listener, I want to explain that the Indian market, like sometimes you hear a market and you think, oh, it's a couple booths. This is the the largest Native American market in the U.S. And I think it's a hundred million that's sold every year. Do you know? A hundred million that's sold? Yeah. Like that's how much money comes to Santa Fe through the market. Yeah, and and it has been going on for like I said, I don't, I don't know exactly what year it is now. Yeah, it's a tremendous economic event, and so people could make like in in your case, how much of your yearly income came from that market? Do you remember? Not a lot. I mean, I you know because um, there were times when I didn't sell anything, but on the other hand, um, people were trying to uh, say they sold out. But they maybe they had one or two pieces. You can say you sold out, and not everybody is willing to say what the heck they made or what they didn't make. You know what I'm saying? Um, so you know, there's no true those there's no true numbers as far as I'm concerned. I guess the city benefits a lot, you know, and and then they have their numbers. But yeah, I think that's what I'd read that it was a hundred million dollars economic impact to the town itself. But like I said, uh, there. Some people do uh, know how to market their work, and they know how to promote themselves and stuff. And and they're less sophisticated or, or willing people to to you know to get that deep into selling. You know, was there any ever friction? Uh, you being Navajo, but making a Pueblo style, was there any friction there, or is it more that anyone that's native can work in any style of any of the Pueblos? Oh, yeah, there's pressure from other tribes because they don't want you to be imposing on their competing with them, basically. Is it financial pressure or is it cultural pressure? It's probably both. But again, uh, I was married to. And I was accepted by uh, my husband's family, and um, his grandmother's the one that you know uh, recognized the fact that that I could uh, that I was good with clay, and she just taught me all she knew, and then I started learning more on my own. So, how did you transition out of that into the fine art world? Did you immediately get an art dealer that started to represent you? Because that's I think that's probably was a tough transition, I would imagine. Actually, no. Um, I started to get commissioned for certain pieces, and and um, I did participate in in a couple of shows um, that went to New York. One was sponsored by by the the people, the Southwestern Association uh, for Indian Arts, who the, they sponsor the Santa Fe Indian Market here. And um, there was a show at the. Uh, Museum of Arts and Design, uh, which is now oh, changed the name there, but um, and and that we also had another show at the, I think it was called the Cast Iron Gallery, and um, anyway, anyway uh, it was at one of these shows that Garth uh, uh, Garth Clark and Mark Delvecchio saw my pieces, and this must have been about. 2002 or 2001 and um so i i didn't everything in my in my life has 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 just come about because of my effort and my hard work and um so i didn't go out and seek anybody to represent they came me came to you <laughs> yeah and uh which was really really nice because uh, you know like again um uh, there are people who know how to get out there and promote themselves and everything, and I was always just pushing my 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 pieces out there for so that they could sell themselves, basically, you know. And I I tried not to be so so you know obvious out there, but I was always experimenting with different shapes because uh, 
um, my pieces, I was getting more, uh, my pieces were getting larger and they were becoming um, elaborate and I didn't want to go get fancy, you know, fancy designs or start painting on my pots and stuff like that. And so I think uh, what happens was, was my forms developed and they're still de- developing. Can you talk about what you're interested in in form? Because I, I feel like that you have a lot of natural influence. Like we were looking down at that pot where it almost looked like a crab leg comes down into a recessed part. Can you yeah. talk about what you draw inspiration from? Anything I can that interests me uh, in terms of texture and um, um, animal forms, animal forms, um, um, uh, the sea, you know, like the, um, what do they call them? Um, just natural forms, uh, shells and things like that, you know. Uh, sometimes I'm at a loss for for uh, some type of uh, uh, design, and, and I'll just look out the window and I'll see something, and, and, and I can put it into my pot. And it, it just makes it unique in that it's not... I'm not following a traditional, you know, line. Did, do you feel free now because of that? Because it's, it's interesting when I look at, at mother to son or father to son teaching where you teach this design and this form and this pattern and then the, the younger generation might change it a little bit, but it's, you know, it's a one-to-one transmission. But now this is your relationship with the clay is what's dictating and your relationship with your inspiration, the land, or whatever yeah. you take it from. Because I'm, I'm a first-generation <sighs> potter. I don't have a, you know, there's nobody working in clay in my family and that taught me anything. Uh, and, and I learned, like I said, I learned it from my husband's grandmother. Um, my son um, has picked it up. I never took him, I never took my kids into my studio and said, here's some clay, play with it, or make something, or, you know. Um not to say that they didn't, you know, play with the clay because all the kids love clay, but um, I, I would, uh, I remember when they were little and they'd come around my pieces and and uh, just because they couldn't help themselves, they would push their finger through the wall, <laughs> and they thought that was pretty cool for the moment. But um, I, uh, I guess within the Navajo culture. Um, you know, we're, we're not learning from books. We're not learning, uh, we're, we're, we learn by watching and just, uh, soaking it up, you know, like a sponge and, 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 and even to this day, I don't, I can't put my finger on exactly what I'm doing right. I just know that it works <laughs> and I just go with it. The surface of your pots there, it's very smooth sanded surface that you've sanded a couple times. It doesn't feel like it's been touched by human hands. It feels like that the sculptures or the pots have grown into that shape. At, mm-hmm. at one time, they feel like they're a shell, and then another time, they feel like they're a stone. So can you talk about that choice to take out the touch in terms of your fingers out of that process by sanding? Like, what's interesting to you about that? Well, one of the things that I thought uh, was very important was uh, it was to for anybody to be able to touch the, these pieces. And um, so if you run your finger along the rim or, or of, of a bowl or something, I mean, who wants to, you know, hit something that's jagged or it has to be a pleasant experience. And, and uh, so I'm trying to, I guess what I'm trying to do is present um, that uh, sense of, of a feel good, you know, it feels good, um, as well as uh, as well as appeasing the eye. You know, um, right now I'm into f- doing the reduction firing, which every piece has been blackened now. And I, and in fact, I the blackening is is a process that I learned from a friend um, after I failed at learning uh, at being able to do it in the native uh, outdoor firing. I wasn't good at it at all. But he uh, showed me that, yes, um, um, you can uh, put them into a canister and with some combustible material, and when that material bursts into flames, 
because of the pot being as hot it is as it is when I put it in there right out of the kiln, then then the flames eat up the oxygen and you put a lid on it and it turns an instant black. So that's, you know, to, again, for me, I love simple processes. I don't, um, you know, I'm, and, and it is effective, so. Can you talk about when you're working in a series, how an idea changes through making four or five sculptures or more? <laughs> <laughs> um, that's just a recent um, development. Uh, things are changing. Uh, we, we're starting to take some some of my pieces that are uh, that lend themselves to be cast in bronzes, in you know, in bronze. Um, and not every piece is will makes that you know transfer very well. Anyway, transfers very well into bronze. But um, yeah, we're, we're we're trying new avenues now. I mean, you know, I think um, I'm, I'm at a point now, I'm like, um, where I, I'm choosing how my, how involved I want to be with my clay, because I, I'm now I'm a grandmother, you know, and I and uh, uh, I guess as you age, you get you're a little bit more conscious of the time you have left here. So you just start hustling. And I thought, you know, I thought life was going to get easier and more simpler, but it gets more and more complicated. So I'm really paying a lot of attention to where I put my time. And uh, when it comes to my my pottery, the family is getting more and more involved and uh, in terms of helping me in, in, in some of my processes because it's, again, it's intensive, you know, labor-intensive. It takes a lot of focus. and. Let's say your son comes into the studio to do some sanding for you. Do you then put, does, he, does his name then go on to that work? Or no. is it, no. okay. No. And so the bronzes, I would imagine, too, are just released under your name and in in, yes. in, uh, poured in additions like you might have four or five. Exactly. And then again, I, you know, the first bronze that I ever had cast was um, the first pot I ever had cast in bronze was the one out the one one that I tried to fire black outdoors in the in terms of the where they uh, it's like a smudging but it's a it's a smothering of 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 the pot in an outdoor fire fire and um I didn't quite I didn't know how to do it but I was trying trying to do this and um I lost a little maybe a dime size piece off of the bottom. And I thought, you know, this uh, piece is still beautiful if it wasn't for that little uh, ding on the bottom. And um, the thing about it was, I said, that's a waste. That's a really, that's a huge waste. So I thought, you know, I'm going to have this cast. And it's a beautiful piece. Even in the bronze, it's a beautiful piece. And, um, and that happened, geez, that's like 15 years ago or something. And uh, I never, another thing I never did was advertised. I never advertised. It was always somebody would use one of the pieces that they had in their, in their shop or their, in, in their gallery, and, and they would use it for their advertisement. So I always figured, well, you know, that's pretty cool because, you know, I don't have to shell out for for an ad for an ad or anything but um so i never advertised you know my bronzes or or uh but i would get i would have one like at indian market uh and uh cuz you know we didn't have a heck of a lot of money to do the whole series at once and um anyway i was able to uh, i think i'm up to like number 9 <laughs> But yeah, it, it, this are, these are recent uh, developments. And how do you decide which ones are going to be just finished in clay and which ones are going to be in bronze? Oh, well, it depends on the... Uh, I'm, I'm starting to see my clay pieces as, uh, what do you call it, maquettes? Or, and, um, and like I said, some of them, uh, because of the, the way they're constructed, 
uh, are kind of difficult to get them into bronze. So um, I like I like real simple forms, and um, uh, right now I think a lot of it's still we're we're experimenting. You know, just trying to see see if that did really did look good in bronze. You know what I mean? And uh, we're making connections now. We we know where to take our our stuff to get to get it worked on and all that. So. Yeah, because bronze in Santa Fe is a pretty big thing. Like, there's a lot of bronze that's made. Um, it's not anything like your fine artwork. It seems more sculptural, um, ceram- or sculptural bronze that mm-hmm. would be, you know, kind of mid size. Your pieces are really big. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'd love to get some uh, monumental pieces out there. Um, who knows? I mean, it could happen. Yeah, and it seems like if, if you if you choose to go in bronze, you could really upscale the work. If if you worked with a foundry to make like instead of making a three foot tall sculpture, you could make an eight foot tall yes, sculpture. Exactly. H- how does the scale change the way that you as an art as a maker think about the idea? To see it actually happen, I mean, we have we we just received a piece back from um well you know, now they do the digital, what is that digital, the uh, laser, laser scanning. And and from that point on, they can enlarge it as big as you want. But, but to actually see a, a piece that I've made by hand and, 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 and uh, the size is dictated by what I can handle physically. And, but to see it bigger, it's, it's amazing. And the size is, is, uh, does a lot for for some of the pieces. And it seems like that you were influenced by jewelry in terms of the way that you work the clay itself. So I think about this like very small, something handheld versus something four or five feet tall. It's a totally different way of looking at form. But you still have such a unique way of, of creating space with the objects. I don't see much difference in, in, in how... And what I apply to to when I like when I was working, we we started out as silversmiths, and um, my husband and I and we went to uh, the Montreal Man and His World exhibition. We were we were in the USA Pavilion, and we were we were very young. <laughs> my my oldest son, who who you met, was only three years old, and uh, but um, I mean I had never been out of the state. Like Arizona, New Mexico, I'd never been out of the states, and here we are traveling all the way across and out into Canada. And uh, but yeah, our jewelry, uh, the meth, all the method- methods that I learned in refining silver after it was cast, like the 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 filing is like what I do in my sanding. Um, the lines of 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 the of the de- design and stuff like that are, are now in my in the lines in my my pots having it overall you ha- it has to feel good you know i st- i still apply that to my clay i'm very precise in a lot of things that i do so that there's not a lot of scraping or sanding that i have to do i i try to create something that's that's less work you know uh, because I know how much work there can be if you build a pot, the walls too thick or, or not even, you know, and, uh, I guess has a lot to do with control, which you think you have sometimes, but sometimes you realize you really don't have, but just knowing how to work with it so that you don't go too far, you know, too extreme. Uh, or it's, it's almost as if, um, uh, pushing you push your material to to be something that it's not you know i have accepted my clay for what it is it's not perfect it's it's fragile it can be fragile it's not like a ceramic you know glazed piece you know it's not that it's a uh, it's different switching gears can you talk about your relationship with mark and garth in terms of setting up the traveling show that you just recently had when they, when I first met them, and they they decided that they would like to carry my pieces in the gallery, and they actually set set me up and a couple of other artists, um, 
um, for, with shows. Like we went to uh, her Tajenbosch, her, her I think is her Tajenbosch in the Netherlands and had a show there. And uh, I just basically do my job, you know, I commit myself to, okay, I have a show and uh, these guys are basically working that one side, you know, and setting it up and, and all this. And, um, and then, and, uh, I mean, to have even a book published of my work was amazing. And Garth, you know, made that happen. Garth and Mark made that happen. It's a beautiful book. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I still can't believe that it, that it's out there. I mean, it's, it's a done deal, you know, the, uh, it's, and to be connected with with these gentlemen are this has been an amazing experience because I met so many other well known potters like yourself and 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 uh, met Nino Caruso. I met him over in Italy and then he came here to Santa Fe and then we met again here in Santa Fe just within like two weeks of meeting him. We came home and he was here. <laughs> And uh, I was amazed because because he's an older gentleman, and I didn't even know if he spoke English. And you know, and it was he was hanging up a show, and we we just stumbled in, and I started talking to him, and it was, uh, but Betty Woodman and just so many 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 wonderful uh, people, and uh, um, I mean, they changed my life basically. I mean, it opened a whole new world up to me. That traveling show that had four locations. Uh, yes, it opened in at in, at the Nerman Museum. Went to the Fred Jones uh, Museum in Oklahoma, and then it went to Houston, and then it went out to the Navajo Reservation, which I was I thought was really cool because okay, here's a Navajo potter, you know, finally in so that was in Winter Rock, Arizona, and, and then the last show was here in Santa Fe. How has having that that exposure in terms of the touring show changed the way that people in the ceramic community around here think of you? Like, have you <laughs> noticed that's changed? Oh yeah, I mean, people are uh, just. I think I shock them uh, because um, again, they have some of my pieces in their collection and stuff. But on the other hand, that I had so much support, so much. Uh, uh, goodwill coming from a lot of my um, clients, and uh, and uh, they were happy that I, I'm able to express myself the way that I can these days with my work. It's interesting. There's all these different ways you can identify yourself as an artist. Like for you, you could say, I'm a Native American artist, or you could say, I'm a woman artist. You could say, I'm a clay artist. You could say, I'm a fine artist. So how do you determine, how do you think of yourself now, and is that different than when you started making clay decades ago? I don't see myself any different. Um, I I think I've always been the way that I am today. It's just that I didn't know how to, how to go about doing what I'm doing. Uh, I don't know if that makes sense, but again, it, it's, when you don't have, um, I mean, I got asked questions that, 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 that I can't answer. Like, who do I, who did I admire the most? Like, who was, who did I look up to, you know, in terms of, I didn't know any powders. <laughs> so I could, I didn't look up to anybody, but I, I would see certain pieces of, of, of pottery that I, I liked, not knowing the artist. And then the time came when I knew every single artist at the Santa Fe Indian Market. You know, I knew their tribe, I knew their style, I knew their their materials, you know, I knew their, it was amazing. Uh, I go through periods where my experiences um, just kind of open up a whole, uh, uh, a door, you know, and then I, and then I can, but I can walk by, back out, you know, I can leave it. I can experience it and then, then leave it and see if that, if I'm going to be using any of these experiences, you know, if I have, if it has any room in my life. I've always been like that since I was little. So I'm, I think I've remained the same and I, I really don't 
define myself as anything. I, I leave that up to other people. I've been in books listed as folk, a folk artist. I've been, you know, just all kinds of things. So it's. Are you ever frustrated in the way that people categorize you? Because when I was, I was doing the research, people always in the first paragraph would say, uh, there's a Native American artist. They would always put that label on you early in the article, which I don't feel like fits your work. I don't feel like that your work, I feel like your work is fine art. I feel like you probably think of your work as fine art. So is it frustrating to be labeled as one thing or the other? No, no, not. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm making a point not to be affected anymore because I think at one point in time it, it did bother me, but that was before I wised up because you, again, you think you have control and you don't, you know, and I don't care if, it, if, if, if I see the print printed uh, article or whatever, and if I correct it because it, it's not factual, you know, and it can still turn up in print. So I, I don't have a lot of trust in the written, anything written. I mean, I don't know, Garth and, and I, we have a lot of fun because he'll say something and I'll challenge him, you know, <laughs> on, on, on his knowledge of, of, of the Navajos or, or even his knowledge about me, how I feel, you know, and, uh, and, and I, and I, I think I tend to change. I just, my feelings, my thoughts, they fluctuate all the time. So I, I think that's where I like to be. You know, it's not, I'm not rigid in anything. And I'll, I like challenges. If somebody gives me a problem to solve, then, you know, in terms of, of make it a piece, you know, I, I like that. And I, I try to, because, because it pushes you to, it pushes you to do something different. And that's what I like. It seems to me that there has been a long tradition of usually white anthropologists coming to this area to study different groups of people, whether it's Puebla or Navajo or different areas. And there's a lot of misconception that's brought to the study of anthropology because there you can't leave your understanding of your own life when you're looking at someone else's life. So do you feel like that as a fine artist that's working in a world where you might have white dealers that or, or anyone authors, writers, critics, anything, that you feel that you have to correct in a bigger way misconceptions about Native life in Santa Fe or just in general? Um, I met a lot of people who have strange ideas. And um, I, guess, I think what I, what I, what I try to do uh, is... Realize that, that that everyone's on they're on their own path and they haven't quite arrived yet. You know what I mean. And everyone has these levels or stages to go through. And so, I don't think you can pick any point in time and say this person has got it. You know, they're right on. You know, I mean, I hear all the time of of of. Uh, things that are like carbon dating and stuff like that, that are always, always set further back, you know, changed. I mean, just be, so again, I, I, I think I'm very accepting of the way things are at any point in time, because to me, it's all about change. And it, yeah, it, it's, it's like, um, it's like, um, if you're set and rigid, you can't bend and you're going to break. That's going to hurt. <laughs> <laughs> and I like being comfortable. So I guess that's my comfort zone. And I appreciate you talking about this subject because I feel I, in the work that I do with ind indigenous artists in Australia, there is a lot of friction between white critics. From the indigenous side, there's been a very conscious choice to not let people come to the land that they live on, to not let uh, people understand the art. So there's certain parts of the art that if you ask them a question, they will not answer 
because it's not the right of a person that's not from that group to know that information. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But when I look at indigenous art in in the U.S., it seems it seems different, like the dynamic is different. And I can't figure out I can't figure out why. I don't know if that's the revival pottery that at one time was made to fit sort of the tourist market, you know, in the late 1800s, 1900s or what. But there seems to be it seems like people here are very open with saying, I'm using this symbol because it means this. And, I, and I'm not talking specifically about your work, but with indigenous art in general in the U.S., it doesn't, that, that friction doesn't seem as visually apparent. So I don't, it's not a question. I just, it's, it's something that I find to be interesting. I'm not really sure how that we've gotten to this point now. I don't know too much about the art, or not art. I don't know if you call it, wouldn't even call it art down there with the uh, indigenous people. Um, it seems different to me. It seems like it's ingrained and, you know, it's just so much a part of them that, that, that maybe it's, it's a too personal of a thing for, for them to share. I mean, there, there are times when I, I get asked questions that, that I guess I just don't, understand that that people want to know but again it's almost as if like I would hold back I would give out certain information but I would hold back other information and again I maybe it's because I'm not as inquisitive you know myself and maybe it's because of the way I was brought up I have a hard time, you know, dealing with people who speak too fast because it's almost as if, are they even thinking about what they're talking about, you know, or is it just something, it's habit, you know what I'm saying? It's not a well thought thing. Well, I have in, among the Navajo people, if you ask somebody a question, they're not going to answer you immediately. It'd take a while. You, and 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 some kid, young kid, who's used to today's world, might think that that person's ignoring me, but they'll start talking, you know. And it, it's because again, it's it's a whole different. It's such a change. We're not. We don't have books, you know. We it's a different type of a passing on the knowledge. It's word, you know, by mouth, and and so there. are, things that are uh, people might take offense to but it's not I don't think it's a, a, a something that's a, I don't think they it, it's meant to be you know rude or crude or you know well when you were talking it's almost like an it's like you have your job as an artist and you make the best work that you can make and then you put that art out into the world and it's sold and people come up with all these ideas about the art. And then you as an artist get to choose, like, do I really tell them what this is really about or not? And that's, I feel like that's like a whole extra part of life. It's separate from the art making itself. And I think sometimes artists, that could be a real burden, I feel like. I, I, it doesn't seem like you feel like it's a burden, but I feel like it could be a burden to try to explain or have to explain certain things about your work. And I mean, one of the things that I love about looking at your work specifically is that the objects are so mesmerizing like the pots the the surface the color the form it's so mesmerizing that I don't often want to dissect it as much as I want to walk around it and just I'm I'm not often thinking what does this mean I'm trying to it's like looking at a sunset I'm trying to just experience it as it is I guess because that's what it is (laughs) 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 <laughs> I, I try. I, you know what? I, don't, I there, there was a time when I, when I needed to, they needed to have names. I mean, that's half the fun is giving. You know, deciding. Okay, you know where did the? Because I start questioning myself, like why? Why am I making this thing like this? But again, I, you know, I'm not. I don't have to know, you know, and uh, I just know that I enjoy it. It's getting me through life. You know, this is what I enjoy, and I'm, 
I'm grateful to have this outlet or this, uh, the means to do what I choose to do. So as, as an artist that's worked for decades and decades, do you find yourself feeling like, okay, I've got 20 more years or 10 more years. Mm -hmm. And then do you feel like you'll retire and just be done? Well, I, I, I probably will. I mean, I don't have any desire to work until I drop really, <laughs> really. Cause it, 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 I've, I, it's taxing on my body right now. You know, I, I mean, I sit a lot, number one, and, and I have to, there are times when I miss the sunsets, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I go in there and I'll work and the day is gone. And it's like, if I do this every day, I'm going to be ready to check out, you know, soon, sooner than I realize or want, or I'm going to miss out on lots. That's why I'm, I was saying earlier that, um, yeah, I'm very conscious of my time now. Um, being the age that I am, which a lot of people might think, oh, you're, you're still young and everything, but, um, you know, I want to take advantage of every single moment. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to do this. I really appreciate it. Mm, thank you. 